come to the dark side. Hey everybody, it's Chip from Discard to Reroll. Do you like alt art cards, resources to help your game, and being part of a great community? Tired of opening rebellion leaders in your legacy packs? Well, save that cash and put it to good use and become an official member of the Discard to Reroll Patreon. Patrons help make the show possible, and you get some cool stuff in return, like Awakenings Vader and Kylo 2 Magna Alt Art, Kylo 2 and Kanan Alt Art Foils, and more. This February, we'll be launching our Discard Duos, Alt Art character pairings that will make you the new master of the meta in your local area. Existing patrons, don't worry, we've got you covered too. You'll get any of the new promos we have at the current tier, and of course, access to the Double Blanks Discord, the best place for you to talk about trash decks, sick nasty plays, and my obsession with double sleeving every card in my collection. Learn more at our website or Facebook page at discardareroll.com, and remember, may all of your rerolls be special ones. Have you guys seen Kylo Ren's lightsaber? Yeah, man, that thing's weird looking. No, it's not. It's awesome. Here, let me go see if I can find it. I'll show it to you. My backpacks got jets. Well, I'm Boba, the fat. Hi, this is the Grand Piche from Dorado, Puerto Rico. Hi, this is James from Wheaton, Illinois. And I never listen to Discard to Reroll with Mr. Chip. And I never listen to Discard to Reroll with Mr. Chip. Oh, Star Wars. Nothing but Star Wars. It's Discard 2 Reroll. We're a podcast about a little dice and card game we like to call Star Wars Destiny. I'm your host, Mr. Chip, and thank you for listening. Today's show can be subtitled The International Edition of Discard Reroll because we've got some content that I want to talk about from a few podcasts I really enjoy. And they're not from the United States. They're actually from Denmark and England. It's a Your Destiny podcast from Denmark and the Three Man Meta from England. They had some great content and, and brought up a couple topics that that probably will be more controversial, but I think that's awesome. And it's something we should talk about as a community. And I give you my take on that. And I think it should get people talking and I'd love to get your feedback. So please, uh, please do share that as we, uh, as we go through today's show. And also we have an interview today that I think you're going to really enjoy. We've got someone who is a purveyor of all things, uh, destiny and board gaming and tabletop gaming. And that guy is Zach Bunn from team covenant. And uh, he's a store owner that cares. It, what a nice promo for him. It's a storm runner that cares. He's got a heart, uh, but truly cares about making this game great. I was lucky to talk to Zach for a little bit and share some of his thoughts about the state of the game and uh, and what are some of the things that the game has going for it and some thoughts about how to, how to help continue it uh, on in the future. So uh, with that, you're going to hear that in a few minutes. How do you get involved? The way you get involved with the program is simple. You send us an email, electronic mail message, if you will. And that is two questions at discardareroll.com. We've got a great community over at Double Blanks and uh, the Double Blanks Discord and all those people. I want to say thank you for all that they do in creating great content. You, you, they stream all the time. Those Like Sir Christopher, uh, who you might have seen or heard on this program. I mean, the guy's, he's a machine. The guy just streams nonstop. Same thing with Jay from Double Blanks. Uh, just, just streaming like madmen. And, uh, and it's been a lot of fun to watch them. And I think, you know, the whole community has really started to do that more uh, to increase the quality of those streams and, uh, and the, the frequency of output, which is great. But what about those, uh, those people who are casually competitive, uh, like, like yours truly? Well, I'm going to go to a regional soon, and I don't know how that's going to happen. I actually just looked up the date just to make sure I'm ready, and it's coming up very, very soon. It's going to be at uh, Millennium Games in Rochester, which for me is about a... Uh, I would say 25 minute drive used to be really close to me. It's a, it's a March 3rd. And again, it's a Millennium Games in Rochester. And it looks like, I mean, I tried to check this a couple of times. I think it's the only uh, regional in New York. So, you know, this, this uh, casually competitive guy is going to go out and try and do his best and meet some people. And if you happen to be there, please stop and say hello. And uh, we might bring some promos along the way so that you get a chance to share in that and, and, and have some fun playing some, some games. And I think as soon as I'm eliminated, <laughs> I'll have plenty of decks that you can play against. And I really, I want to be able to place blame on someone other than myself when I lose. So I'm going to do that on my coaches. You know, they call each other coach all the time on double blanks, but, you know, they let this guy sit out here and suffer. I guess, I don't know. I'm out here in, in the wilderness, just left to his own devices. I guess that's how you learn. It's fight or flight. So we'll find out uh, how we do on the regional coming up soon. We'll talk about that. But today is the international edition of discarded reroll. Why do I say that? Well, I say that because uh, there's some great content that's out there by our fellow content creators abroad, one of which is Your Destiny Podcast. Now, that is a podcast out of Copenhagen, Denmark. Very unique, and uh, I love listening to those guys. To help our Danish listeners, I will be interjecting traditionally Danish sayings in, in what I'm talking about with Star Wars Destiny. So we're going to start with uh, Owls in the Bog, right? So our Danish listeners now have, I mean, we're the we're going through the roof in terms of downloads now. We're going through the roof. Owls in the bog. 
And that means something suspicious. So in their last episode, they had a chance to interview the, I think his title is play manager, organized play manager for Asmodee Europe. That was Alex Watkins. And also his uh, strange obsession with Alex Watkins. I guess uh, they, they cross paths very frequently. So the organized play manager for Asmodee Europe had some interesting stuff to say. I love the questions that they asked, and they really put him on the spot in a positive way because it sounds like a, he was very gracious with his time, and it sounds like a great guy. I don't know him, but it sure sounded that way on the, on the podcast. Anybody who dedicates their time to a, a Destiny podcast uh, is okay in my book. Uh, anyway, they talked about sideboarding, and it was a great question. You know, I'm not sure. I mean, he's an organized play manager, so I would think that uh, if he's responsible for Destiny, he might have some inside information on that. You know, th- this is not to get him in trouble, and he, he said it, this is has not been discussed with uh, FFG. But what he said was very interesting. And he said, you know, a sideboard is difficult because I don't think they have any plans in the near future to go to more than a game, right? So in traditional competitive destiny, you play one game against an opponent and then you're done. And then you go on to the next one. They call that the first round of those tournaments. They call that Swiss, but it doesn't matter. The, The point is that for the most part, until you get to the very top level uh, finals of a, of a tournament, they call that the top cut, that you would do two out of three. So if you play the best of one, meaning one winner take all, that, uh, that it's hard to think about how a sideboard would be possible. Now, sideboarding is, again, I, I keep going to Magic, and I don't mean to, to, to make you think like I think Magic is, a, is the best game going. I, I don't play Magic anymore, and there's a big reason for that. And that's because I think Dis- Destiny is a way better game. So please know that as I, as I share that with you. Uh, but, but I, I, you know, you just got to, there's, there's a, there's a template of success for this that I love where destiny breaks off from it, but having a sideboard is, is a good thing, you know, and it really helps you, uh, have some cards in your deck that at least give you a fighting chance, um, against certain, certain decks that are in the meta. So having a sideboard when it's a best of one, you know, how's that even possible? But he had a great thing to share. And that is that, one of the rare differences, he said, that between Destiny and Magic is, is, is between hidden and public information. And that is a huge difference, right? So in Destiny, what do you do? You sit down at the table. And many times, most players, particularly in casual, but I see it in tournament play all the time when you watch these things, because I'm obsessed and I, I have nothing to do, so I watch those. Actually, I have lots to do, but I still watch them anyway, uh, is that uh, people don't hide their dice, number one. Uh, for the most part. And number two, um, that they put down their characters first, right? That's the first thing you do. You put down your character pairing. So that is public information. And then you have your hidden information, which is your deck. But again, it's not that hidden because you see the cards, at least with dice, right in front of you for the most part. And those players know what you're running. I mean, there's a limited card pool at this point, and uh, so you have an idea what your opponent's running. So stay with me for a second. So in, uh, in Magic, um, you know, you, you don't know what your opponent's running. In fact, a lot of people, one of the strategies in Magic is to throw your opponent off, right? So, you know, you have tokens, you could have colored tokens, and you use the opposite color than you're playing in a token. And so, you know, you try to get as much of a competitive advantage as you can around hiding that information. So in uh, Destiny, that's not the case. So in Destiny, you have those, that public information, which are the characters, right? And you know at least the colors that you're playing. So, you know, if you see Seventh Sister in front of you, um, and you see, let's say, Sienna Ray in front of you, and then you also see Night Sister in front of you, I think you probably have a good idea what you're playing against. And also, what cards that if you had an opportunity to change your sideboard, that you would. So the concept he introduced was, uh, would there be a time, possibly, that a sideboard would involve three to four changes max, is the, the what he used. So that absolutely is a great idea. And I think that has 100% been talked about. Now, would you do that casually? I don't know. I mean, it's casual. It doesn't matter what you do, right? But in a tournament setting, could you see three to four changes max in your deck? I 100% can. And do you think that people, when you talk about getting ultra competitive, do that already? I got news for you. I bet you they do. Now, I'm not calling anybody out for that because I don't know, but I'm just thinking that humans are humans. And sometimes you want to get a competitive edge, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so I see that, I see that totally happening. Uh, I love that idea. I thought, I, I don't, you know, sometimes you have to uh, see things from a different perspective before you, before you can see the light. And I feel like that is me seeing the light. I loved that suggestion. And I hope, I really do hope that Alex Watkins was talking about something that is 
is true and that could happen because that would be helpful. I absolutely see that happening. I predict that it is something they talked about, and I predict that it's absolutely going to happen after uh, this, you know, whatever it is, if it's Worlds or whatever uh, major tournament that marks the beginning and end of a year, um, I think that it's going to happen. So now join me, if you will, from Copenhagen, Denmark. Let's head over to Norwich, England, where our boys from the Three Man Meta are. Now, Three Man Meta, if you haven't heard them, they are an extremely ultra-competitive podcast. And even though, excuse me, even though I'm not an ultra-competitive player, again, I'll be in a regionals competition, but uh, I I don't consider myself to be ultra-competitive at all. I consider myself to want to have fun. I, I really enjoy listening to them. Fantastic stuff. And, I, you know, if people care about it and they have fun interacting with each other, it's good stuff. It's great stuff to listen to. So they talk about a topic which is very – it's always one of those that gets people very sensitive, and that's cheating. Now, if you're casual, who cares? I mean, we don't really care. You just want to have a fun time. You want to have a fair game, and, and it is what it is. But here's the deal. Uh, I don't know if you know, but when you buy a pack of Destiny, it comes with dice. So – when you introduce dice, this is the idea of rolling dice, rolling a die, the mechanic, it's gambling. I mean, it's got that feel to it. Since the dawn of time, since biblical times, people were trying to get advantage, whether it be a shell game or rolling the dice or waiting or loading dice, like that is going to happen. It's going to happen. And it might have happened with you. You may be one of those people. I don't think you are. I mean, you wouldn't be listening really to this podcast, I don't think. But it may have crossed your mind, right, to look at uh, the how do you control the randomness? I mean, I feel like that is a fair question, right? How do you control the randomness? And when you introduce a die, the idea is that it's supposed to be really random. Now, the reality, the reality is, and you can, I'll put some uh, links in the show notes, that there's a lot of videos that are, <laughs> the sad part is that I actually watch these and my wife mocks me endlessly for that. But there's uh, videos on like how dice are made, And if you're one of those people, you know you're one of those people right now. Like you have actually sat and watched a YouTube video on dice, right? And how they make dice or all that stuff. Um, I think if you look at dice, particularly with the legacies variety, if you will, quality has, uh, it might have been fallen off the last few weeks in production. And I wonder what's inside one of these die. So naturally as part of the process, there's air that gets trapped in those dice. And air is in the middle of the dice someplace, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes when dice or die sit, when they are whatever process they use, whether you're cooking them, air can go to one side, usually the top of the die. So whatever that bottom face is ends up being the face that is weighted. It's weighted on the bottom of that die, meaning that when the die is rolled, it has a tendency to drop down on that side, meaning the lighter side would go to the top makes sense, right? That's physics. So if you have a die that is unintentionally imbalanced, it's a loaded die. Now you didn't load it, but it's a loaded die. So if a die itself has a tendency, a natural tendency to roll and and have a conclusion that is more favorable than the other, or not even favorable, that is more apt to occur than another, then that's, that's not good. I mean, it's supposed to be random. The idea is random. When you shuffle your deck and you pull five cards, that's supposed to be random. The intention is that that is a random process. So things that we do uh, legally to control the randomness are fine. What are legal ways we can control some of the randomness? Well, uh, if your opponent has a, is going to discard one of your cards and you, you use some of your social cues to maybe uh, help Uh, an opponent choose one more than the other based on where you're looking or where you're holding it in your hand. Like those are, those are legal. You're not, you're not cross-boarding. You're not cheating. You are using the tools within your disposal to try and help guide your opponent to make decisions that are more favorable to you. That's okay. That's totally fine. I think intentionally make, you know, tilting, which is just a a funny new expression now that I never even knew before I started playing Destiny. But if you're intentionally tilting your opponent, you know, that's no good. Like like uh, when people who constantly shuffle their cards in their hand, like there there is a point when you just got to chill, bro. Like on stream, oh my god, if I see that more, I'm gonna get sick. Anyway, point being, legally controlling the randomness is different than uh, illegally doing that. So back to uh, being across the pond, our friends at Three Man Meta, 
And to help our English listeners, I have some expressions like pulling a blinder. Pulling a blinder. Do you know what pulling a blinder is? I don't even remember. Pulling pulling a blinder. It sounds bad. Uh, pulling a blinder is uh, they played something very well. See, I think the three-man meta pulled many blinders. Is that the right way to say that? Um, yeah, to the point. The point is they talked about a few different things that people do. One is salting your dice. Now, what is salting your dice? Salting your dice is an old golf trick. Uh, and I've got a family uh, who's been involved with golf for many years. And the idea of salting a golf ball means that you take a golf ball, you take a salt water solution. Uh, many times it's a, either a cup or a little bit more than a cup. And it's uh, three to six teaspoons of water, but that there are three to six teaspoons of salt. You mix that up. You put the ball in and you spin it and you see if it uh, it freely rolls within that water and doesn't have a preponderance to or a tendency to to uh, float to one particular pip on the golf ball, right? Because you want a balanced golf ball. An unbalanced golf ball, it would make sense, would go all over the place. So take that onto dice. It's a way that people uh, check the uh, tendency of rolls or uh, weighted rolls for a die. So you may have done that yourself. Now, why would you do this? For me, it would be to make sure that a die is not weighted, that a die is completely random and fair. Others would see exactly if a die was loaded to one side or the other, and if it was a favorable roll, they would use it. And if you have enough of these die, particularly not the ones that are very expensive, like an ancient lightsaber, but maybe uh, a die like cunning, and you salt that die to make sure that that's going to roll the special more often than not, that's cheating, straight up cheating. So how do you combat that? Uh, it's simple. You have a dice rolling app. I mean, it solves the problem. Have a, have a, and fantasy flight games can absolutely do that in five seconds because there's already ones that are online. So you have a dice rolling app. If you really are worried about it, or you know what you do? You have a apparatus to test that die before you even start playing. Now, do we have to get there? I hope not. I hope not. But if people start talking about that enough and people are actually doing that, I'm not, I don't want to play you. I mean, it's bad enough. My knowledge of the game will help me lose way more than the die will. I promise you that. But I don't want to play somebody who's going to roll consistently well because they have taken 27 Hondo die and they've salted them until they roll specials. Now, am I saying anybody's done that? 100% no. Please understand that. I have, n there's zero, zero in me that believes that anything has happened relative to that on the tournament. Now, you may know that and you might share that with me. I don't know. And again, we're not ultra competitive on this, but some of our listeners are ultra competitive. And I, I'd love to get your take on that. If you f Do you feel like this is a problem or do you feel like, you know what, it's fine. It doesn't even matter. And it is, it's, if you've ever salted a die, by the way, it is a mess. And it, who knows? Who really knows? But the other thing they talked about uh, was cooking the die cooking the dye. That, that, that's a dangerous and crazy of which they talked about. And again, please, this is, they, it was awesome that they even talked about this and expressed how stupid it was because that was their take on this. They expressed how stupid it was. But the idea of, of dice cooking is that you, you're placing the dice into an oven that, by the way, that's plastic and not good for you to breathe, almost like shrinky dinks. Shrinky dinks are okay. That's fine. But you take your dice, you put it in the oven, you bake them, until the air rises to the top of the side of the die uh, that you you want the favorable roll on, right? Because if you just put the die down, so you got to make sure it's not too hot so it melts the die, but it's not too cold that it doesn't do anything. So you put it in for, I don't, I don't know what that time is, I've never done it. But uh, basically the air bubbles would then try to rise to the top and before the die really melts that you would stop it. And now you've basically loaded the die that way. Uh, Destiny has dice that make it really hard to uh, inject something, but a lot of times people will, in uh, casinos, you know, the way that they weight those types of dice is that they uh, drill into one of the pips. Now, a pip is a mark on a die. So they drill into that pip, they replace the pip with a heavier substance. So when you roll, the tendency is for it to want to drop on that side. So the other side is what ends up being the, the roll. That's a deep dive in, uh, in, in cheating, but to, to the point. The point is that uh, it's dumb, number one. Number two is it takes, away, it takes away the randomness of the game, which Destiny has two levels of randomness to it. It has card draw randomness, and it has die randomness. So another guy who's talked a lot about this was Rebel Gray, uh, who's another great content creator, and, and mentioned some of these stuff and gets into the percentages and things that, uh, that 
if you, unless you're a really hardcore nerd like myself, you, know, you might not, not care about that stuff, but it's fascinating to listen to. And, uh, and it is, it's what makes destiny amazing. And, and, uh, Sir Christopher, again, one of our, uh, one of our great friends talks a lot about at the end of the day, if you roll good or you don't roll good, uh, you know, that's the end of the game. I mean, if you roll bad, it doesn't matter who you are or how well you play, you're going to get beat. So I love that about the game. I really do. It gives, it gives people who are competitive enough a chance to be successful. And it's what makes the game extremely unique. And I, I love that about the game, and I want to see that continue. So the fact that it's, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. You hear that expression, where there's smoke, there's fire? So there's a little bit of smoke going on. It's not just baked dice smoke from the oven. Maybe we do like a drug testing. We check for uh, VOCs in your blood before you start to play. But do, do we really want to get there when you have to salt test your die before you play in a regional? Do we? I mean, do we have to get to the point where you, um, where you make people use a dice rolling app? Maybe. Maybe you do. I, I don't know if that's a bad idea. You know, I've thought a, a lot about that. And I thought, you know, what, what's a solution to the problem? There you go. There's my take. Tell me I'm crazy. Tell me I'm stupid. Uh, but just tell me something. Give me your feedback. Again, it's questions at discarderreroll.com. Uh, super special shout out to the 25 people who makes uh, our community special and our patrons. And I can't wait. The uh, Grumpy Jedi are, are one of our high rerollers. His brother, you're going to hear more about him in the coming weeks. You got to see that this guy is an amazing artist, like this hidden artist in Puerto Rico. Incredible. And did uh, Zeb Yoda, one of our discard duos. And, uh, and I cannot wait to share that with you. It's heading to the printer. Fingers crossed this week. Uh, we have alt art. We announced our alt art C3PO for all of you mill players. We had the rebel spy on talking about how mill players are, the, are just the devil. But it, uh, you know, again, shout out to him for coming eighth in his tournament and uh tiny grams who came in i think it was the runner-up in his tournament too so i know that guy's super busy and clearly still has what it takes to be a competitive player so congratulations to him so we've got those uh, pairings coming out and depending on who we end up playing and somebody recommends that i play for our tournament i man i i I don't even want to tell you what i'm leaning towards i'm really leaning towards something like an ob ob somebody maybe oh i want to try ob maz i know that's not the greatest pairing right now but I kind of like the way that, that deck plays. Let me know what you think I should play. Again, questions at discardedreroll.com. Now, uh, we got an interview. So the rest of the show is going to be the interview with Zach Bond. Now, Zach uh, was gracious enough to call us on his way home. And you're going to hear a little bit of that robotic uh, voice coming in and out. That was not him trying to impersonate uh, a sentient being. That was just the fact the connection got a little wonky. But, uh, but the content is great, and it's there. He talks about Han Ray because he's uh, you know, one of those Han Ray players from way back. I think you're going to really enjoy the interview. And, uh, and so thank you for listening. Next week, we're going to hopefully get uh, Jay and Chris back on the program. I've got a lot to talk to you, uh, Chris, about. He's gone, he's gone straight up trilogies. Uh, he's gone straight up trilogy in his streaming. He's given up standard. So we'll see how that's gone. I, my prediction is that didn't last at all. Uh, that, uh, but again, we want to say thank you for everybody listening and uh, get involved in the conversation place in destiny and as always if you've been a fan of star wars destiny for any length of time then you know about our guest tonight historic team covenant has been producing high quality card and board game youtube content for over seven years to the tune of over i gotta double check if this is right one million views is that accurate one million views (laughs) crazy Uh, i mean technically we've you know to correct you know correct some of those stats not that i care too much but uh we've been posting videos for a little over 11 years and uh, at this point, I think we have eight or nine million views, somewhere in that range. Eight, okay, let's. Well, why, where did I get that then? That was must have been old. <laughs> All right, let's try it again. Uh, he's been yeah. producing high quality card and board game content for over eleven years to the tune of eighty billion views. It's amazing. From uh, Netrunner to X Wing, Legends of the Five Rings, uh, Team Covenant helps create a positive community both at their storefront in Tulsa, Oklahoma, or online. Uh, also, if you're thinking about opening a store in Tulsa, forget it. These guys have the Oklahoma market covered. Uh, most recently, they've uh, released a new series entitled Learning Destiny, a comprehensive guide for new players, which will undoubtedly serve as a resource to new players for years to come. And I hope so, because that means my thousands of dollars in the game is not wasted. Uh, also, if you've ever thought about playing Han Ray, well, the guy to learn from is right here driving in his car. He took that deck to the top four of the Dallas Regional just a few weeks back. Is that that's that's accurate, right? Top four. That is accurate. You nailed it. 
So we're talking about none other than Mr. Zach Bond. Zach, how are you? Thank you for your drive home tonight talking to us a little bit about Star Wars Destiny. Of course. I'm always always game to talk a little bit about Destiny and happy to be on the show like this. Huge fan of community content, always have been, so happy to support it any way I can, even if it just means being on your show. Well, spe- speaking about that, you you are, like to me, the king of community content. So I know you have a storefront, but the videos that got me into the game – uh, bar none period were the stuff that you produced. It was such high quality that I was actually confused thinking like, is this FFG? Like, is this their, is this their retail store or like what? It just was so good and so well produced and uh, just fan service. I loved it and want to say thank you for that stuff. It really did get me in the game. Well, that's, that's awesome to hear. Oh, you know, a huge part of why we do anything that we do is uh, for that very reason right there, which is, just trying to make it easier for people to get into the tabletop gaming community and stay involved. So when it, it literally is making that happen, that's really awesome. And then not only that, but it's making it happen for someone who's going out there and creating content and trying to build community themselves. So really humbling. And uh, I'm really, really happy you enjoyed it. So was Destiny something like, Are you were you a big Star Wars guy and you had the store already going and this was like a natural fit for you? Or how, like how, how did your connection with this game as strong as it's been uh, happen? Uh, I mean, a handful of things. So, you know, I, I founded Team Covenant back in 2007, um, and we've been, you know, selling tabletop games online and locally in Tulsa and creating content and building community and whatnot ever since. Um, I also grew up, I've been a huge Star Wars fan since I was seven or eight, and I've played just about every Star Wars tabletop game ever made. And so I had previously been really big into the Star Wars LCG that Fantasy Flight Games had made. Um, and you know, a lot of the games that we cover and support at Team Covenant are made by Fantasy Flight Games. So they had announced the Star Wars Destiny game just a couple days before Gen Con 2016, I guess it was. And at the time of the announcement, um, you know, I, I actually ended up writing a blog about this very thing, which was called I Didn't Want It To Be My Destiny. Uh, but, you know, they made the announcement and they had these big, big colorful dice and it was collectible and uh, we'd been basically not doing any collectible games whatsoever in our store or online um, for several years. So there was a lot of reasons that it just kind of like Destiny wasn't at up front super exciting or, uh, you know, interesting to us. But FFG was making it. We knew the art was great. Um, Lucas Litzinger, who had been the designer to kind of refresh and Netrunner when it rebooted uh, into the LCG, was at the helm of Destiny. So, and we really loved Netrunner. So, we wanted to give it a fair shake. We tried it out at Gen Con, and you know, I, I took a couple games and just fell in love with the game. It's very simple. It's very fun. It's a back and forth action. It's very interactive, and it's just Star Wars, and it's great and it's thematic, but it's super simple, um, and it accomplishes you know all the things you want out of a game. And so I was pretty confident that at that point that the game would do very well. I mean, it's Star Wars. It's quick. It's fun. It's collectible. The dice kind of, as you start playing, fade into the game. So uh, at that point, both as a player and as a fan and as a retailer and as an online retailer and as a content creator, I uh, was super pumped. And we kind of just dove in and, uh, you know, started making content, started making products like the Saga Tokens and the Saga Sets. And it's, you know, like you mentioned at the top of the show, coming back around, now we're, we've started doing these learning series, which are these kind of comprehensive video and blog series to help make it super easy for people to get into a game and uh, excited to be working on the Destiny Learning Series right now. So uh, w- did you have a relationship prior with FFG and you talked about Netrunner because you, you had, that was at your store previously, correct? Yeah, I mean, relationship in the same way that, you know, we have a relationship basically with any any company that might make games. So the standard distribution model still applies, which is game maker makes the game, they sell it to a distributor, distributor sell it to retailers, which were one of those. Um, but you know, we, we opened our physical store, um, back in 2012. So we'd been an online only company for five years at that point. And we had inventory employees and stuff, and we really wanted to open a local space. So we did. And at the time, you know, before that, we actually only sold collectible games and singles online and that, that whole side of the market. But then, uh, you know, we were opening a store and we wanted to build a local community. And so, we started looking for really high quality like RPGs and miniature games and non-collectible games and board games that we could, you know, use to build community and, and have additional products that aren't just collectible games. Cause we've always thought 
a lot more people could be in the tabletop games than there are. So we wanted to have a nice array, a nice selection of what we thought were the best games in each category. So back in 2011 at Gen Con, actually, uh, we were kind of cruising the hall looking for games that we might want to put in our you know, eventual local store. And that's when I actually stumbled on the Fantasy Flight Games booth. And, and at that point, they were a much smaller company. Right. Um, that was before they had the Star Wars license. They had um, Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings. But that was Game of Thrones before the show really took off. And so, uh, but I, I played Lord of the Rings, and I'm, I'm a pretty competitive, I wouldn't say competitive. I like one-on-one competitive games, and I am a very competitive person. But at the same time, I'm not like cutthroat, if that makes sense. Right. Um, so I pl- you know, got a demo of Lord of the Rings, the living card game. So it's not collectible and it's not competitive. And I just thought it was great. Um, it, it was unlike any game I had ever played. So I was really interested. Also picked up a core set of Game of Thrones at that Gen Con and uh, got, became really fascinated with the LCG model. Um, as a lifelong kind of CCG player, this was a way for me to experience a collectible card game without having to spend enormous amounts of money on these games and without having to crack random packs and all that kind of thing. So it was a really interesting concept to me and one that I very much wanted to uh, check out as a company we wanted to check out. So we started selling those products in our store online. We started offering a subscription service for the LCGs, which is a really big deal for us at this point, a big part of what we do. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's where we really interacted with Fantasy Flight Games for the first time. And then... Um, you know, by the time Destiny came out, we had been, uh, you know, selling several of their games and in our local store and online and creating content around them, obviously, because that's just kind of part of what we do for any of the games we're selling. So uh, a couple of the video, like the video with you and Lucas has visited the store a few times and and uh, played with them. And just describe that for me. How did that happen? Uh, how did uh, how did Lucas show up at the store? Yeah, I mean, that, it, I don't know how. Cl- I mean, I don't have my map in front of me, but if I look at Tulsa <laughs> and I look at I don't know Minnesota, they don't yeah, seem. They're well, we make that road trip twice a year now to drive to Worlds. Actually. Right, uh, it's a little over ten hours of a drive, but you know, I mean, effectively, we were uh, we've hosted like regionals and store championships and that kind of thing. And when it came to Destiny, right, like, um, I I really believe Destiny is one of the best games I've ever played. And I, I think it could be a tremendously big game. And not, not because I think it could, you know, go swipe a lot of players from some of the other games. But I think that a lot of people could get into this kind of a card game with Destiny because it's so simple and so easy to learn. And it's Star Wars. And so, uh, you know, because of that, we kind of went, all out at the time, everything we had as far as blogs and videos and local store stuff. And so in, uh, you know, the game came out in December and it kind of just immediately sold out. Right. Um, and then they were, you know, announced reprints at some point or whatever. But at that time, like the, the first major tournament was going to be the world championship in May. And then the next real season would be, um, I guess store championships that happened, um, in the, the, the summertime, but you know, we, the thing, we were just really excited about destiny. So we reached out and we're like, Hey, we'd really love to host, um, a big destiny event. Um, and we'd be willing to, you know, market it and have, you know, we're going to post a ton of videos and we want to post gameplay videos from it. Um, we'd really like to do it around cause we, the, you know, the world championship ended up being just that first set. Right. So we wanted to do it around, uh, when the second set was coming out and kind of go from there. And then uh, it just kind of developed from there. So they were they were responsive and they were willing to. Uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, they were responsive and willing to kind of participate, and they were willing to to send Lucas. And then they made available those community promos for the first time at our event. Um, but yeah, that's we were just talking with our, our normal event contacts there, and they passed it up the chain, I guess, and it got approved, and we ended up hosting an event. So I'm th- thinking about that game, and, and so I, I'm an old Magic guy who got out of it after you know the just the, the chase and it's expensive, and and then I saw these ridiculous play school chunky looking dice, and I thought, sure. man, there's no way, there's no way this is going to do anything. And then and then I played it, and that was the end of it. You know, you open one of those packs, and it's just I don't I don't know if, if there's crack in there or what, but it's just as addictive <laughs> as a game. And then I look at your site. 
Zach, and I see like and not being to your your physical store, but it seems like the vibe that you're going for is that new, um, which I think is super exciting. But that idea of the community building around not just uh, you know the magic Yu Gi Oh scene, but like the the community around board gaming and getting non gamers involved and bringing that all together. How, have they have the two of those things clashed together? Like, or or have you seen that type of player? drift a little bit over into destiny, whereas magic might be a little bit too big of a leap for that. Like how, how do those come together in your store? Um, I mean, so the interesting thing, we do, we do things pretty differently. I think the most, most stores, but like, you know, we don't, we don't even have magic or Yu-Gi-Oh or Pokemon in our store. Um, and so there, I guess there's not really a clash. Uh, a lot of the people that come and hang out and are in our community locally, um, Destiny or X-Wing or Netrunner, um, and go down the list, Arkham, what, whatever game, uh, it's it's a lot of times their first experience with a game, you know, an expandable kind of lifestyle, ever-expanding style game. And we have a lot of board games, and we have a pretty strong board game community, and, and we do a lot of league events that are, we have an ongoing league all the time. Uh, that's really geared around participation and not just winning tournaments. And so, it, you know, it's hard to say because we're just so focused on helping new players get in um, that it's just kind of a, a culture that's kind of developed in our community where that's the natural state of things versus like any any sort of clashing happening. Right. So so Awakening comes out. It's You know that it's – is it a hit for you right away? Like do the product – does it sell out really quickly for you and your store? Uh, I think when Awakenings came out, it was a hit for everyone in the world. Um, every, literally, I mean, it, the game came out on December 2nd, and it was sold out in November, right? Like, right. there was a pre-release at FFG's headquarters, and then there was a pre-release at stores the next weekend. And once people got this game in their hands, which we, we the same thing happened to us at the Gen Con, get the game in your hand, you play a couple games, and then you're just kind of obsessed and so pre-orders from customers to stores and from stores to distributors just skyrocketed at that point. And no one could get it enough. Everyone was sold out. And it was kind of a frenzy. So we, we had a pre-release at our store a couple of weeks before launch. And, you know, we had we, we sold out of however many kits, they, or however many sets we, we could possibly sell to get people in the game at that point. Um, and so it was kind of just madness. I think it was uh, obvious to key a hit for pretty much every store that was you know, smart enough to buy it or pre-order it in time. So how did you, how would you keep the the momentum going? Because I really feel that it were stores like you that help sell this game um, to people like me who saw your videos, but I can't get it. H- how was that period of the product availability not being there? And uh, what, what did you do to, you know, to help that or, or keep players engaged? Um, you know, honestly, that was, that was probably the hardest part of Destiny. Um, because there were people that had the product and people that didn't. And then the people who didn't were kind of getting agitated. They couldn't get it. And I don't think that's ever, you know, what anyone wants to happen. I mean, you, you want to sell out of your product if you're, if you're fantasy flight right. games, but at the same time, you know, selling out completely like that, where there are people that literally just weren't getting any, um, is not ideal. Uh, and it really, I think slowed the growth of the game down. And thankfully, they reprinted and they got Spirit of Rebellion out, and it it has stabilized since. There's enough inventory where there's, you know, I think you can pretty much get any box that's been released so far at this point, um, whether it's online or at a local store. Right. So, I, I don't, there really isn't a great answer to that. That's just you know hope hope enough people in your local community had product to, to sustain the community long enough for that second set to come out. And so now now you've got Spirit of Rebellion and. All of a sudden, FN comes out, and maybe competition changes a little bit. Where I think there's a pretty good video that you've done out of one of your uh, a million videos that you have that talks a little bit about uh, the state of the game and the need for some some tweaking. So, sure. descri- yeah, describe for me that period, and do you feel like the the adjustments to the game were positive and that it's, it contributes to the health of the game or do you feel like there's still more to be done? So just that experience, if you talk about that. Sure. I mean, I think the, the, the reality was there was a time in the game where nines was just kind of oppressively good. And then Phasma came out and she was really good. And then even a time in the game before legacies where Ray, Ray Poe was, was obviously, you know, kind of a step ahead of a lot of things. Um, and that's that's not great for a game, but I think the changes which came in the f- form of the balance of the force and the uh, errata um, were really, really 
great for the game and and kind of the health and state. And I'm really happy with it where it's at now. But I think the more important thing is that there was this time period where it seemed like FFG didn't want to make a move. Um, and, you know, I, I do think they waited um, between the supply issues and then you had that kind of balance issue happening. I... I think that they were probably a little too conservative and that probably cost the community quite a few players who just got sick of Pomas and nines uh, right. during, during that phase of the game. Um, but the other, the other side of that equation, I think, and I think the real solution to all of these problems is draft uh, because draft is, in my opinion, one of the best ways in the world to play a collectible game, one of the best ways to collect a collectible game. And so it, it took them, you know, over a year now to, to get an official draft format out for the game. We still don't technically have it yet. And so I think draft is fundamental to a game like this. It gives you a format that a player can own basically nothing and play the game at a, you know, real level. Right. Have a good time, start building their collection. And, it, you know, in, in moments when the meta may not be balanced, you can always draft. Now, have you gotten word on that, by the way? When you're, so it seems like it's shipping or at least it's getting close to yeah, I think their website, they have that upcoming page and it, it, it's shift, shifted to shipping or I think it was shipping, which usually means it's like a, a couple of weeks away when it switches to that. Right. Awesome. So I think we're within a couple of weeks at this point. So you, so you talk about Lucas a little bit and him coming down to the store and it's clear that this guy, I mean, his involvement with the game and it's amazing and addictive. And so now you've got a transition with him and, you know, people can be critical all they want, but I mean, the, the game's amazing and the, clearly the adjustments were made. Now you've got Jeremy Zwern who's taking over the game um, and you had a, a great video with him and talked to him about the future of the game a little bit. Do you think it's in good hands? What What do you think he brings to... Uh, to the future of the game. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's in really good hands, honestly. Um, as far as Lucas goes, I mean, he he was a great systems builder, and he's a very creative designer, and he pushes the limit on a lot of things. Uh, conversely, I think Jeremy, you know, as we talked about in the interview with him a little bit, um, you know, he's like a four- or five-time world champion. Um, but he's also not, he's not the kind of world champion that, like, like he found cards that were basically undercosted or undervalued and, and made really good use of them. And so he has a really good head on his shoulders when it comes to the fundamentals of understanding, you know, why something should cost a resource or an action and restricting, you know, power actions is an example of a powerful thing that you can do once per turn. And so, you know, I, I was, I was pretty excited to see him on a game like destiny. I think he's, he's got some really, really good attributes as far as you would want from someone designing a game. So <coughs> pardon me. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think he's, he's great and I'm, I'm really curious. I don't know how far Lucas designed into the game or how many sets have right. his, his handiwork on it or not. But I, I know that I really like what I'm seeing in legacies. I really like the two player starter a whole lot. I really like rivals. I like what they decided to do with draft. So I'm just really excited. I think with any game, uh, the first, you know, handful of releases are pretty hard to get right. And you learn a whole bunch at that, you know, in those first couple sets. But the thing he said in the interview with him, um, and that, that interview on YouTube is really worth watching, but the thing he said was he really wants to differentiate the hero and villain side of the coin and then the different colors. So I think that is one of the most unique and cool things for a designer to use in Star Wars Destiny, where you have these natural lines dividing hero and villain and then blue, yellow, red. Um, and so I am gleefully excited to see how he pushes each of those in their own way. And so you think about all these changes and this great, exciting new meta that legacy brings and rivals. And so then here you have Zach and he plays Han Ray. So like when you think, <laughs> when you think of Han Ray, you think of you quite frankly, which is crazy that that's what you're known for now. Um, but so talk to me about that. You went to Dallas and played this thing. We had a, a big debate about, um, you know, net decking and that you have to play whatever the, whether it's just insert deck here, right? Whatever the hotness is, but here's a guy who's played this same deck pretty much from the beginning. I'm sure there's tweaks, but what is yeah. it about that deck that you like? Um, and you know, what, 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 what insights can you give about why this still is a deck that's competitive? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a handful of things, right? So, the first thing is the FAQ slash errata that happened is was only good for Han Ray. Um, Han Ray didn't get touched. I thought Ray's action, like gain an action when you play an upgrade on your mind. The upgrade and up 
upgrading over an upgrade rule did get altered, so you can't chain as many actions together as you once could with Hanrei. But the reality is, like, Viber Knife got, you know, kind of knocked down a little bit, and that was one of the things that made Hanrei so vulnerable. Both characters only have 10 health, and so the deck really leverages the sh gaining the shield ability of Han to basically cheat in health, right? So in Awakenings, when I played it at Worlds last year, um, those shields were just as good as having extra health, right? So on a turn where you might play two ambush cards, that's just the same thing as you know playing Field Medic, which is pay one to heal two. So when Viber Knife kind of got you know a, knocked down a little bit, um, I think the shields got better. I think that the the kind of decks that were a problem for Han Ray. Um, nines being one of them it just had a lot of characters with a lot of you know like best defense and a lot of redeploy assets so it was hard to get on top of that that deck uh just weren't as good anymore um and no one's really dealing with action chaining anymore like there's no no one's really playing around that people are playing a lot of control cards they're assuming you're going to roll dice in that they're going to be able to manipulate right and so there were some favorable things there but really what would the real nuts and bolts of what happened is after the errata, I put Han Ray back together um, and kind of just was mess, you know, playing around, playing some games. And I really thought at even before Legacies that Han Ray was pretty strong again, um, pretty powerful. And part of that is because Ray got a lot more upgrades that make her die really good. And by that I mean you have the the black sides on melee dice way more than you did in the early days of the game. So in Awakenings, it was basically like Ray's staff and lightsaber were your options. Right. Um, and now you get Ray's lightsaber, you get ancient lightsaber, you get heirloom lightsaber. And so, and a, even a single heirloom lightsaber on Ray makes her plus two sides a monster, right? Especially when you have action chaining. But you also got Vibro Knife. So you get a two cost ambush upgrade that gives Han a shield, that gives you two actions when you play on Ray, that also makes Ray's die pretty awesome. Right. So. Uh, all that that factored in. The the big thing that happened though is that Legacies came out um, about nine days before the Dallas Regional, or it didn't come out. It the preview wave. Right, right. Forgive me. Uh, <laughs> came out about nine days before the regional. Uh, I said that in air quotes in case you. Yeah, right. It. I, um, I could feel them. Yeah, you could feel the air quotes. Anyways, so I literally had at the time, right? I, I actually didn't know until like a day or two before that whether or not legacies would be legal at Dallas. Right. And the story of their common ground games, they ran a great, great tournament, but they emailed everyone that had pre-registered uh, like a day or two before legacies came out. It's like, Hey, just want to let you know, legacies is going to be legal. If you want a refund, you can let us know, but otherwise, you know, prepare yep. for a fun event or whatever. Right. Uh, and so that's when I found out and, you know, ultimately what, what happened is that when a new set like that comes out, we're pretty busy at work and I was going to be gone the next weekend in Texas. So I had some stuff I had to do with the family that, that weekend before. And so I just didn't have that much time, um, to, to really build a deck and optimize it, um, with new characters from legacies. I also ha don't really like looking at spoilers that much. I like opening packs and, and seeing things and being surprised or seeing a new right. set for the first time in person. And so I hadn't really been net decking or watching what people were talking about online. And so all the things I've said combined with the fact that I just wanted to really run a, a deck I was comfortable playing at the regional. Uh, and I landed on Han Ray and I, I considered what decks I thought would be popular. I knew Yoda would be popular. He's great. And I uh, felt like my deck was pretty good against things I, I thought I would see. And so... I went with it and uh, ended up getting to the top four. I lost to my friend Eric. He turned in the uh, Isla double Padawan list. And really, Han Rey, any any three-character list that has a decent amount of control is hard for that deck to get on top of. Right. I mean, that's the winning deck, correct? What, uh, what beat you? Yep, yep. Eric went on to win. He's, a, he's not only is he great, but he's great. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> he's great at the game. Awesome. He's, he's actually one of my many hidden secrets of right. being good at the game, which is all the Tulsa people who are also really good at the game helped me be very good. That's awesome. So what, like, so um, to our new players and, and uh, I know you, you 
really help promote the game and the new series that you have coming out is just as good as your old stuff that you've put out. Um, and hopefully two, better. <laughs> what's, it's, what's that? I said hopefully better. Oh, yeah. No, it's definitely better. Definitely better. And uh, you play, I forgot, what did you call it when you play Open Hands? together that you gave it we had like a trademark name to it i forgot what you called it uh, oh yeah in that video we called it all in all in yes all in that was your earlier series i think i tried to watch you play you did a han ray all in um with your colleague yeah. and i'm forgetting his name right now uh, uh Steve, with Steve. yeah yep yep so um so what would you recommend when new players come in i know you like that two-player set which is awesome what would be a deck that if they all right so they bought their pat some packs now they bought you know a, a mixture of, of the sets that are out there what would you encourage him to play? What do you think has like a very easy, if I'm handing it to my wife, you know, what, what, what's the deck I'm going to give her? I mean, honestly, I could, I could list a lot of decks that I think are like straightforward to play, but I think more, more importantly than that is, is just making sure that it's characters that you are interested by. Right. Um, whether that's like thematically in terms of like what they're doing in the game or even just, you know, like my, my fiance is a really big Yoda fan. So like, she, she plays some, not, not a ton, but like here and there. And so like her interest level went way up when, when Yoda was announced, right? Because it's like, that's who she actually wants to have on the board. And you probably were um, able to open board. up enough packs to get him because I opened five boxes and you get, didn't get one. I'm not bitter, but I didn't get one. Well, you know, if you just buy a saga set. Oh, see, <laughs> small pro. Just those kidding. are, I do love the saga sets. They're awesome. It's very cool. Yeah. I'm just messing with okay. you. No, I mean, I get it. <laughs> so, but anyways, yes, yeah, she, I would recommend to a new player, right? Uh, find characters you really like, put them together. Get, the other thing I really recommend to new players is just get to the table, play a lot of games. Right. Um, don't don't stress over decisions. Play quick. That way you can get more games in. You'll learn way faster. And I know it's hard to kind of get over that barrier, but um, you know when I'm learning a new game for the first ten times, I'm literally I don't care, and I I'm a very competitive person. But I know that the fastest way for me to start winning is for me to lose a whole bunch up front. Right. Um, and so just make quick decisions and have a good time and don't ever take it too seriously and play, play characters that you love. So going forward, we, I know that, uh, the, you're probably familiar with tabletop simulator and as a retail store selling the actual product, what's your take on where that is right now? And do you see FFG stepping up? You know, they announced that they're doing something with, you talked about it earlier, the, uh, the Lord of the Rings game online do, do you see them putting some resources in the destiny basket online or do you see tabletop simulator still sticking around for a while like what, what's your what's your your take on the online community around that um you know it's funny we're we're going to be doing I don't, I don't think it's next week but at some point in the next couple weeks we're doing a like tabletop and technology podcast episode where we talk about like uh virtual reality and online games and 3d printing and all kinds of stuff like that but in regards to TTS, you know, I think uh, we're very, uh, I would say, I, I don't, what's the right even word for it? Maybe progressive. Like, we're, so I am not afraid of any, any medium, right? Uh, I ultimately very much believe on a core level in the, uh, the power of tabletop games to create profound human connection, unlike anything I've ever experienced in the, the communities that surround games. So, I I prefer the physical myself, right? I, I, I obviously I'm into tabletop games, so I like playing physically in person. And I think everyone that plays these games also prefers that. Uh, but the truth is that you can't always do that, right? Sometimes you're busy. Sometimes you don't get free until the night time, and you have kids and you're stuck at home. Um, sometimes your friends live across the the country and you can't play with them. And so I think community is community, whether that's online or offline. And so I would love to see them support in some official way. Uh, a game like Destiny online, and with the Lord of the Rings uh, online, they're kind of stepping that direction. So I, I think that'd be great. Um, and if not, I'm I'm happy that TTS gets to live. And you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, hey, you free for a game on TTS? And I'm I do not like playing games online like that. Um, but I also think I'm I'm a bit spoiled because you know most days after work I'm walking out and I'm going through our local retail store right. and there's we have a really strong community so there's usually people hanging around looking to play um and i would almost always rather have the physical opponent uh, because it's that human connection that is really special about games like this so uh 
yeah, I mean, I don't think it's bad for the community. Um, I think it helps people try the game out. I know I have a couple of friends actually who hadn't been to the store in a while or the community and they've been playing destiny online and they thought that our destiny stuff was all happening on Saturdays, but we have Saturday tournaments, but we also have Wednesday night league night and they both have jobs during the weekend. So they found that out and they started coming in on Wednesday and they'd been playing for months online. Right. Um, and we're only really interested because they had been playing online. And so, you know, I mean, there, there's cases, both directions of people getting out of a physical game because of the digital, but also people getting in because they could try it out online. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm all for experimentation and, and seeing what happens. And I, I think it can definitely help grow the community. Awesome. So Zach, I want to be respectful of your time. I know you're probably sitting in the driveway at this point, but uh, the last question I have for you is what do you hope happens with the game? Like, where do you, where do you, where do you see it going? Either what you prognosticate or, you know, what, what do you hope FFG does with this destiny? Uh, that they have? I mean, you know, my, my ultimate hope, I would love to see destiny um, become a, a really huge long-term great gaming community and success of a game right um i i think there's a lot of things that need to happen for that to happen and one of those for me is i i would go you know all in on draft like i was mentioning earlier i think it is just the perfect format for new people to get in i think it is honestly one of the best ways to collect the game um where you basically get to play the game as you're collecting it instead of having to like buy a whole bunch of boxes and try to get yoda right um and so I that just, doesn't I work, that, by the way. That doesn't work. It just it <laughs> don't, don't try that. I mean, a case is six, right? I, oh. I should have done a case. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think I, step one for me would be just triple down on draft, draft support, draft league kits, draft organized play. I would push the fire out of draft. Um, and I think the community would, would grow a lot because of that. And the reality is, you know, I mean, looking in the future, uh, it's Star Wars. It's super fun. I think it's very well designed. And I hope that this game and this community has years and years and years ahead of it. And I think it can. It has all all the elements of a game. It needs to have to do that. Um, so, you know, we're there's a there's a reason we're putting so much time and energy into a series like Learning Destiny. Um, we want to make sure anytime someone's looking to get into a game like Star Wars uh, Destiny that it's as easy as possible uh, because we want them and we want this community be, to be huge uh, because I think that there's a lot of people who can get into this community who aren't already playing games with Star Wars Destiny. Well, I'll tell you, if you keep making good content like you are, um, it can't help but do that. And FFG really needs to, they need to take care of you because you really helped to make the game, I think, what it is. And like I said, I, I'm, I'm, it's not a lie when I tell you it got me really pumped about the game. So I appreciate all the content you've done. Now I've got to say one thing for my, my best friend, my dear friend, who was the best man in my wedding. I went to his basement where we were going to play some of this destiny. I wanted to introduce him to the game. And I saw these boxes in the corner, uh, like these almost Tupperware looking boxes in the corner. And there were these little monster looking figures. I said, what's <laughs> this? He said, you don't want to know. He put so much money into monster apocalypse. And he says, you, you need to tell those guys they need to re-release it somehow. They need to figure that out because he loved that game. And I cannot believe how much he bought of it. Yeah, I mean, Monster Apocalypse was a fantastic game. And really, honestly, um, you know, looking back, it's funny. The game is great uh, and it's super fun. If you're into kaiju, uh, it's even better, right? Uh, but probably the most remarkable thing about Monster Apocalypse was the community. Uh, that was some of the best people I've ever had the privilege of, you know, hanging out with, playing games with, traveling with, going to tournaments and seeing. And we, you know, we go to Adepticon at this point. It's in Chicago in March, pretty much every year. And uh, a lot of the, a lot of Monster Pocket players are from the, that area. And so, uh, you know, we, we catch up with them almost every time we're there. And still just like, I mean, that was almost a decade ago now. And uh, it's just an incredible community. I think that's really one of the biggest things about tabletop games that that i'm attracted to as a person is just you know somehow i mean i i've been a part of these wonderful communities all across the globe and have friends everywhere basically because of them and uh you know i I haven't seen anything else that quite does that no it's definitely it's awesome and uh like i said i appreciate you taking some time out today now tell people it uh if they want to head over to your store like what what's the what are some of the things they can do to get involved with you or, or get a hold of you or see the stuff that sure. you're selling? What do they do? 
Uh, well, if you uh, are interested in any of the store stuff, obviously, if you're in Tulsa, you can stop by the store. Uh, Star Wars League nights on Wednesdays, uh, but there's usually Destiny players around. Uh, we also have Saga tokens, which are the compatible tokens for Star Wars Destiny that I'm a pretty big fan of. And then, of course, Saga sets, which is the every time any set's coming out, we, we sell Saga sets where you can get basically two of everything and one of every legendary, um, all in a nice... Nicely packaged and organized and sorted set. So if you don't want to have to deal with the booster packs and all the time spent chasing cards down and trading or whatnot, it's it's really a, something designed for them. Like I said earlier, we came from years of, of being involved in LCGs where you didn't have to like chase cards down. So right. it was a pretty obvious thing for us to do, to like want to make where it's like we had a lot of people who had watched us for years who were interested in Destiny but didn't want to play that game. So uh, that's that's kind of a product for those people. Uh, and then, of course, you know, on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, you can find find all of our content. And over on our website, teamcover.com, we have the Learning Destiny series. We have some seriously fun and awesome content coming up for that, from basic deck building guides to advanced deck building guides to buyer's guides to gameplay videos. Awesome. Um, we did some pretty cool ones with, like, just the starters. And then we kind of evolve it with, uh, we go from the starters to the, the two-player starter with the character starters. To, we did a trilogy format, uh, all of Legacies and the Jeez. two-player starter stuff. Uh, you guys are machines so, over there. Well, yeah, well, we're we're, we're really work really want to make a great series with Learning Destiny. So, uh, have a lot of a lot of content coming that I think will be really enjoyable, especially if you're newer. Um, but some of the advanced stuff, I think, for for even some you know longer-term players, will be very interesting. Talking about some resource and damage curve, uh, you know graphs and charts and stuff that'll be pretty fun so you did some great anyways, tournament you, you, coverage you, that all the site. you, you did What'd some you like say? really good tournament coverage too where you i mean like it it must have taken you forever though to make those videos like you're doing the cutaways and you had the you know the the the, the players were explaining their thinking and then you cut back to the game and the overlays and just insane <laughs> like uh, it was insane that must have taken you for absolutely forever to make those are you going to do any more of that type of stuff of the competitive scene coverage or are you more you know, keep it in house and uh, just pump that stuff out uh i mean we're our, our kind of content is evolving really um we we spent a lot of time doing a lot of unboxing videos for the lcgs and then a lot of gameplay videos for all the games and you know we we've been doing gameplay videos for probably six or seven years by the time we did that world championship finals and so we developed a lot of systems to make that easier than you would think but the the seven years of developing the systems is what was tough um but, you know, I, I will we post more games like that? Yeah, probably. Um, we'll see. There's a lot of, a lot of people creating content uh, focused on the, the really competitive players. And what we found out is that that's just not most of the people that play these games. Right. And so when we're spending a lot of time and energy making this content and we start asking why we're doing it, and, when, you know, the answer comes back that we want to make it as easy as possible for people to get into these gaming communities. Um, a World Championship Finals... M- might be that video but at the same time you know like right now we're doing the learning destiny series and we just think that that's actually going to be more helpful to the community than just another gameplay video of a finals yeah i couldn't agree with you a thousand percent and i think you're you're in the right space and i'll tell you if you ever get tired of doing it and you need somebody to encourage you again i'm telling you it just brings people to the game so thanks for all that you do you know it's it's hard you know you're, you're trying to make a living and um, and your podcast, by the way, you didn't plug that at all. People really need to, to subscribe to that. It's fantastic content. It really <laughs> yeah, is. You can it's, find you can find the Covenant Cast on iTunes and YouTube, you and that's you know we 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 try to take very specific things that happen in the industry and talk about them on a more meta level. So you know the FAQ or or errata might happen for Destiny, and that will lead us to a conversation where we use that to talk about errata and FAQs and tabletop gaming in general. How about talking and, about donuts? Uh, like one guy, you know, like you, you celebrated, I forgot what it was, but like that you were out of debt and you let him get as many donuts as you wanted and you ring up a $5 bill and the, the guy hadn't eaten in three days because you don't pay your employees or whatever it was. But it was just fascinating. <laughs> Do people actually get paychecks now over at Covenant? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, th- so that was... Uh, we we sold something similar to a saga set for Monster Apocalypse, actually called a uh, faction pack, where you because it was a collectible miniatures game, and so you pick your faction, and we would give you all the models from the set for that faction. And uh, he and he and his friend and me and my little brother Tim uh, basically worked overnight after a set came out to pack all, like unbox all this product and pack all these sets up, and then uh, then after that I was buying everyone 
uh, you know, donuts at six in the morning because there's a donut shop a couple of blocks away from everywhere in the small town where I grew up. And, uh, yeah, my Jonathan, who's one of the key people at Covenant, uh, was like, Hey, or how many can I get? And I was like, Dude, <laughs> order as many as you want. And then he ordered like obviously $5 in donuts, right. and like two dozen. Uh, and it was just hilarious. It was a very hilarious and notable yeah. moment. But I- it's just amazing it was, though. It was I mean, good time. You're definitely passionate. And, and that, I mean, that's, it's different. It is, to, it, you have to, I know that that's, you, you really ask those core questions about what you're trying to do as a business and as a company. And, uh, you know, when I got my Empire at War Box, I mean, it felt, it just felt different. So, you know, people, if you're looking for a great place to, to get stuff, this is not a paid promotion at all. This is just, it's true. It's what I, I, there's other places you can spend your money, but if you want somebody who really cares about the game and cares about you as a person, um, you see it with everything you order. So, Zach, I really appreciate you taking time to talk to me and and people who listen to this show and keep up the great work because it's 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 noticed and it's awesome and I think it makes a difference. Well, I really appreciate that. It's very humbling and uh, it, you know it was an honor to be on the show. Happy to be back anytime you want me. So hit me up and uh, thanks for having me. And everyone listening, thanks for listening to to this conversation. Uh, keep listening to community-based content because uh, these, these people put a lot of work into this stuff and, uh, you know, for you to enjoy it. So dig in and be sure to shout them out when you enjoy their content. You're the man. Thanks, Zach. I appreciate it. You betcha. Thanks.